Yes, and the last book, Spiritual and Visionary Communities, that Bill mentioned, uh, is, of course, available for examination downstairs. Uh -huh. And uh, this talk is really a condensation of my chapter there. Intentional communities start with enormous bursts of idealism, often with a vision of little less than transformation of the world. Uh, those who help start and build them put their lives and fortunes on the line for causes in which they passionately believe. The energy involved in envisioning and building a community, however, is difficult to sustain indefinitely, and over time change, sometimes major, sometimes minor, is inevitable. Many communities simply close in the face of changing circumstances, but many others persevere, often undergoing major institutional transformation, for better or worse. And some endure for long periods of time with few fundamental changes, although small changes always. This paper will outline some circumstances that have led to major changes in intentional communities and then undertake three case studies looking at the ways three very different communities have evolved over time, one experiencing major changes, one experiencing less substantial ones, and one staying quite close to astounding principles and practices. Many things can uh, lead to a major shift in community life, so let me name a few. Uh, one such thing is a leadership crisis that can occur when a leader dies or has some kind of scandal, for example. Father Devine, the head of the Peace Mission Movement, uh, which was based in the U.S. but had uh, communal homes worldwide, uh, he was considered God in the flesh by his followers. Uh, and uh, it was believed that he and, for that matter, the followers would never die. And after Father Divine apparently did just that, at least he disappeared from the scene about 50 years ago, uh, that uh, made it hard to attract new members where the fundamental doctrine was challenged. Uh, and that was that Father Divine's movement is very close to the end of now. Uh, scandals can also lead to serious disruption in community life. Sex scandals and financial misconduct are frequent in the world of communes and religious movements, and a movement dependent on, on one defining personality can find itself suddenly adrift. Uh, such a community may disband or it may change under new leadership, but some kind of change is inevitable. For a millennial community, and there are lots of those in the world, the failure of the millennium to arrive, the apocalypse to arrive on schedule can be terribly disruptive. In some cases, the leader whose prophecy of the apocalypse has not come to pass admits error and steps down, steps down, as was the case with Lawrence Hoyt, leader of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists uh, in Texas, who announced the kingdom of God would arrive on April 22, 1959. Uh, when her prophecy failed, uh, Hoyt resigned and dissolved the organization. She incidentally is here with her husband, Victor, who was really considered the founder of the movement, but when he, she died, he took over. Or he died, she took over. Uh, anyway, she resigned and dissolved the organization in what she thought was disgrace. Christian history particularly is littered with failed predictions of the millennium, and such a failed prediction brings major problems to a group. On another front, the outside world can force change in community. For an isolated and disciplined community, things like electronic media and mobile phones can introduce the temptations of the outside world to members. But more importantly, I think, uh, communes just about always arouse suspicion, often hostility from outsiders. To many people, uh, difference is problematic, if not downright pathological. Why, why do they live differently than we normal people do? And just what is going on in there? They're probably plotting crimes, aren't they? Having orgies, at least. Uh, who knows what terrible things. These kinds of prejudices have been around as long as groups themselves have and can lead to change. Pressure can lead to change on a group and often to the demise of a group. Conflicts over land use often plague intentional communities. Land use laws often don't allow communal living, so getting proper permission to open an intentional community can be very difficult. In this case, the community has to change somehow to survive. Disasters can force major changes. Communities are subject to the same unpredictable events we all are, and things like earthquakes, fires, storms, floods can bring major changes. 
or change can come, often does, from financial instability. Great many communities are undercapitalized and they struggle to do such basic things as provide housing. Uh, and that may lead to change, very likely will. Another driver of change is lack of skills in farming. Many communities seek to support themselves on the land, a great rural ideal, uh, often through organic gardening and farming. Uh, food production, however, is labor intensive, especially organic production. Usually requires specific farming skills that many communitarians do not have. So changes in a community's goals and practices may well result. And then one major inevitable driver of communal change stems from the progression of, of generations in a longer lived community. A driving force in any durable commune is a common vision, and the vision may change with membership turnover. The needs of community members also may evolve over time, generating more communal change. The passing of the founding generation has had dramatic effects on one of the world's largest sets of intentional communities, the Israeli kibbutzim. This is Degania, the oldest kibbutz at its beginning. Uh, in the early 20th century, hundreds of young Zionists set out to build Jewish communities in Palestine, eventually creating nearly 300 of them. The communities the pioneers founded were socialist and egalitarian. Everyone worked, everyone shared equally in the fruits of the work. The founders, though, are now passing from the scene, and new generations are not as enamored with the strictures of communal life as their predecessors were. <coughs> change, change, change. Finally, a, a fundamental problem in the world of intentional communities, and the basic reason why so many communities are short-lived, is that trying to enact a vision can be profoundly exciting, can produce a great surge of energy that is necessary to bring a vision to life, whereas maintaining the community once it has been built does not tend to produce high excitement or deep commitment. This tendency to be excited about what is new is found, I think, throughout human culture. Um, a friend of mine once decided to open a retail shop and for nearly a year located a storefront, worked on the shop's layout and began ordering stuff with great excitement. A year or two later, however, I had occasion to speak with her about the shop, which had been very, very successful. And she said she was bored. The excitement was in the development of a new idea, transforming it into action. Later, maintenance of it all was dull. And so it is, I think, with communities. So with these observations of the drivers of change in place, I will turn to three case studies, one in which a community survived after undergoing major changes, one in which changes were more modest in scope, and one that persevered with fairly little change over three quarters of a century. Uh, a community that went through great changes but managed to survive in new circumstances was the farm of rural Tennessee, USA. It began under the leadership of a hippie spiritual teacher named Stephen Gaskin, who began holding weekly gatherings known as Monday Night Class in countercultural San Francisco in the late 60s. Eventually, Stephen and some of his hundreds of followers took to the road in a motley caravan of old school buses and delivery vans, settled in Tennessee, and started to build an intentional community. New members turned over all their assets to the community, they took vows of poverty and lived in utterly simple circumstances. They were really practicing altruists who, despite their very meager circumstances, sent members out to help others, people victimized by earthquakes and floods, for example. They were opposed to abortion and made an extraordinary offer, I think unparalleled offer, to pregnant women. Rather than have an abortion, come to the farm, have our midwives deliver the baby for free, and if you like, you can stay at the farm with your baby, or you can take your baby and go. Or uh, if you like, you may leave the baby at the farm, and some family will raise it. And if you ever want your child back, you can come and get it, and it's all free, completely no charge. How's that for an offer? Um, the teachings of Stephen, though, um, had problems. They were culled from many religious traditions and reflected widely held spiritual themes. Uh, meditation was a hallmark of the group. But, but all was not well, especially after the initial thrill of building the community subsided. Over time, the attraction of living in poverty dwindled for many. As one member later recalled, mothers wanted 
shoes for their children, and some members decided that the world of crass, rampant materialism really wasn't so bad after all. It all came to head to head with a financial crisis. The farm was deeply in debt, with no visible way out. So a radical reorganization took place. Uh, the totally communal economy was abandoned. Members had to work for money and pay dues to live at the farm. The farm had some businesses, such as one of the first soy foods companies, so some could continue to work on the premises. But many more had to go outside to work in a rural area that had few jobs. So not surprisingly, a great majority of members simply left. In the end, however, um, existing businesses were expanded and new ones were started. Uh, some of the most devoted communal believers banded together to continue sharing their incomes and they lived alongside, alongside others who made a transition to private economics, kind of a community within the community was there. Today the farm is stable and multi-generational. The idealism is still there, but not exactly in its original form. Change has come and it has been changed that has enabled the farm to survive. This is one of the current projects. Is Albert here? Albert Bates? This is his project for sure, the Eco Village Training Center. Want to learn how to build an eco village? Albert can show you. Other communities have experienced less radical change than the farm did, surviving with relatively fine tuning. Hutterites are an example of that. Uh, they are a set of communities that have changed a bit here and there, but still persevere. They, they still have full community of goods, and I would say most of their ideals are still intact. They date their beginning to the early Anabaptists. They dated at 1528 when they all pooled their possessions, so they're closing in on 500 years. Uh, they saw such communal sharing as biblically mandated, and through most of their history, they fell in fast to that communal commitment. Uh, facing persecution in Russia, they moved to America in 1874. Uh, they settled in three colonies, and the story has pretty much been one of prosperity and expansion. They did suffer persecution in the United States during World War I because they're pacifists, and uh, most of them at that point moved to Canada, but they've expanded more than 100-fold from their original 400-odd members. They now have about 50,000 members in 500 colonies in Kansas, uh, Kansas, uh, in Canada, the United States, Japan, and Nigeria. Although they've held tight to their central commitment and let change enable them in smaller ways to survive. I think the most obvious change in their life has been the adoption of modern agricultural technology. Uh, but social and spiritual life within the Hutterite communities is much slower to change. Domestic modern technology has been resisted consistently. Radio, television, and the internet remain officially forbidden, although the barrier is not without its cracks. Hutterite colonies are usually remote in location, and without private cars, it's kind of hard to get into town, get away from the colony. Town visits do occur. You have to go to the doctor, for example, but self-sufficient colonies remain pretty isolated. Despite all of that, there has been change that has crept in and enabled them to survive. Uh, computers began to be tolerated when it became obvious they were useful to large-scale farming operations. They eventually, some of them at least, began to see the value of education beyond the age of 14 or so. Uh, and at least one Hutterite high school even exists today. That's an extraordinary change. Personal electronic devices like mobile phones, though still nominally <coughs> forbidden, are actually fairly common and very big change, birth control, still nominally forbidden, but who knows what a woman talks about when she goes to visit the doctor. Uh, it's making inroads, and it's leading to a slowing growth rate for Hutterites who've traditionally been incredibly fertile as a population. So with Hutterites, we have a movement that's not been absolutely frozen in time. Uh, it's changed, but yet it still is quite true to its original founding spirit, and the communal economy is still there. Uh, the church is the center of every colony, and the traditional sermons are still preached in the traditional German dialect called Hutterisch. Um, traditional clothing, including, well, you see it here, including the much-noted polka dot scarf for women, is still standard. So they've let changes come in, but only on a controlled basis. They have a strong social structure, strong group identity, and very importantly, a strong unifying faith. 
They do a very intense job of socializing their children into communal life. They control colony size to keep uh, relationships fairly intimate. And they're fairly prosperous, making colony life materially attractive and much more secure than living on one's own in the outside world. So as long as those core commitments stay in place, I think the Hutterites are good for a long time to come. Uh, finally, there are communal movements that change very little over time. Uh, his members not only continue to subscribe to the, the Founders' vision, but live lives much like those of their predecessors. Case in point is the Catholic Worker Movement, very much alive worldwide after about 80 years. In 1932, Dorothy Day and Peter Marlin, especially Dorothy Day, inaugurated a three-point program for social reform. Roundtable discussions to clarify thought, houses of hospitality to serve the poor, and agronomic universities, as they called them, to teach the poor to grow food, communal farms, that is. Uh, they uh, began their well-known newspaper, The Catholic Worker, still in publication today, still at the original price, one U.S. cent per copy. Uh, the, soon after the newspaper came the Houses of Hospitality, refuges that served the needy with the Catholic workers themselves living right among the people that they serve uh, in communal settings. And finally, the farms came into being as well. Uh, today, all three of those Catholic worker programs endure. The newspaper is still published, it's still the same price. Some farm colonies continue to operate, and houses of hospitality now number several hundred in the United States and around the world. Uh, and it's still very Catholic. Catholic piety continues to infuse the movement. These are regular churchgoers for the most part. They motivate the service and the activism that are the lifeblood of the movement. So thousands upon thousands of intentional communities are active around the world, and patterns of continuity and change among those that have survived more than a short time vary widely. Indeed, they defy just about any generalizations. Some changes come incrementally as mundane realities of life, like raising children, earning a living, maintaining the facilities, displace or at least mute the creative energy of the founding years. Some come quickly, often as a result of changes in leadership or membership. One can analyze a specific community's trajectory, but rules governing communal, communal evolution, I think, are quite elusive. The farms succumb to economic crisis, but also to changing needs and expectations of members as they settled into family life, and to some degree uh, to increasing unease with the spiritual teachers, organizational leadership, not spiritual leadership, but organizational. There's no overarching explanation for the changes in Hutterite life. Rather, the movement simply makes adjustments from time to time and has managed to do so in ways that don't undermine core values too badly. The bottom line, I think, is, is simply this. All things human evolve, and they do so in many and mysterious ways. <laughs>